Hello, I'm Elizabeth Dondonell, licensed marriage family therapist, and I'm the founder of the East Bay Center for Anxiety Relief in Alameda, California. And I'm here to do the second part for the Alameda Chamber of Congress uh, mental health series um, for um, sole proprietors, entrepreneurs, employers, and employees. And the second part is how to manage manifestations of unhealthy stress. So if you remember from last week, or if you haven't looked at the first webinar that, um, you know, I want to make sure that you understand the definition of stress that I'm working from. So defining stress is that stress is a physical or emotional or mental tension that you experience when you care about something. So perhaps you might think, well, then I must be stressed a lot because I care about many things. And there's truth to that, actually. Usually anytime we engage in anything that we care about or that we value or feel is important or want to do a good job, um, we typically have a little bit of tension around that because we're very focused and we want to succeed or do well. And on a day-to-day -day basis, we do experience this kind of stress or tension. And I like to use the scale to help define what is healthy and what is unhealthy is use the scale from one to 10. So when I'm using the word healthy, that's stress that's around a, a two to a five, right? And we reach unhealthy stress when it is a five or higher on the zero to 10 scale and that it lingers or it's consistent or it's reoccurring and it creates a high degree of emotional upsetness. That's one of the keys. And the emotional upsetness then creates an obstacle in the day-to-day -day functioning. And so how a quick review of how unhealthy stress manifests, and remember that's that five or higher degree of stress that you would experience when you check in with yourself that lingers or is consistent, like every day you're waking up now for the last couple of weeks or months and with a big dread and not wanting to get out of bed, that would be an example of unhealthy stress. And how unhealthy stress manifests is that first there's a, usually there's an experience of overwhelm and that overwhelm can be internal, such as what I just gave an example about, which is, you know, you're waking up every morning and your thoughts are already racing and you're thinking about all the things that you need to do that you haven't gotten done from yesterday that need to be done by tomorrow and all the deadlines. And you just have this feeling of dread or there can be external, which is overwhelming circumstances, such as what we're in. <laughs> as far as the pandemic and the political system uh, situation and everything else that's gone on this year, those are overwhelming, stressful circumstances that are external. There are, many of them are beyond our control um, and yet they are so pervasive and significant and we hear so much about them that we carry a sense of overwhelm with that. When we're very overwhelmed by um, either internal or external, it starts stimulating a thought process called ruminating. And what ruminating is, is that churning that you do when you think of a thought and then you, you maybe put it down for a split second and then you pick it back up and you're spinning it. Many people have different words for it. They're spinning, they're worrying, they you know are churning. Um, and by definition, ruminating is that thing that a cow does, which is chew on its cud and churn it over and over and over again, right? And so that is actually what the, a cow does. And for humans, it's a, what we do with our thoughts. Now, this thinking of ruminating is very cunning and powerful because it gets us to believe that we are genuinely trying to solve a problem. The problem is that ruminating is stimulated in the brain as a, what do I want to say, a protective mechanism in a way, because it's a mo there's an emotionally a charged situation. The body's going, ooh, this is uncomfortable. I need to solve it. Or the brain's going, ooh, red alert, something's not right here. Brings up an image which 
is manifested usually as a thought. And then you sit and spin on it because the idea is that this is so uncomfortable, whatever the situation is, or you might be thinking that it's going to go very bad if you don't solve it, or it's been going on too long, or there's a variety of things that you can think about the situation and it's emotionally charged. And so it keeps triggering in your brain and your brain, then your mind grabs on the thoughts all about it. And you're trying to solve it to help yourself feel better. The unfortunate thing is, is that actually all it's doing is like the hamster in the wheel. It just keeps triggering the emotion. It triggers the thoughts and around and around you go and you think you're going somewhere and you're actually going nowhere and you're stuck. And actually what it does is just inflames the very emotions or uncomfortable or unpleasant feelings that you're trying to get rid of. And two styles of thinking that it typically mani manifests ruminating in unhealthy, stressful situations is um, global thinking or magnification, that I would call it. And that's where the situation is bigger than it is. And it doesn't seem like you can break it down into small parts and you're looking at the whole thing all the time. And it's difficult to get specific or be focused, which makes the problem untenable at times or very hard to solve. Or then there's the um, catastrophizing or cat catastrophizing, cat catastrophizing or what I would call to of, um, you know, ma uh, also magnification, but also kind of all or nothing thinking, which is, you know, what is, so one way it goes is into the what ifs, like, well, gosh, what if I can't, you know, if I can't pay my employees this week and then oh my gosh and then I'm going to lose my business and they're all going to go hungry and we're all going to be on the streets and we're all going to be homeless it's that thought churning that gets you there very very fast and then disables you you go from a to z automatically and disables you from taking small bites and trying to solve the problem So those are the two predominant styles of thinking in ruminating, which then all of this overwhelm, ruminating, magnification, global thinking, um, catastrophizing, all or nothing thinking, all the what ifing causes us to go internal and it creates an isolation. And what that isolation is, and it's we're all very vulnerable to that in these times in particular, because physically we are isolated in many ways. And we're not connecting with people and not out in the world and not being external, if you will, as much. And so our thinking will, this style of thinking will draw you in, even though you're functioning it doesn't stop. It keeps gnawing in the background. So for example, what this looks like, this type of disconnect is, is you very well may be on a Zoom meeting, or for example, you very well may be listening to me doing this webinar, and there are thoughts in the back of your head churning about the next thing that you have to do, or the, the last employee that called in sick, or you know, making sure you want to make sure that your children are doing well on Zoom school or whatever it is, and you're thinking about all those things, and you keep holding on to those things while you're interacting, for example, listening to this webinar or on a Zoom meeting or even talking to someone. So you're there, you're functioning, but you're very disconnected. You're very absorbed, if you will, self-absorbed in a way, but in a way of the thinking, which then disconnects you. So then you're more prone to forget things. Uh, it's difficult to understand things. It's difficult to focus, right? And this just internalization, this internal isolation just really sucks us in when we get this thought process going. And then how it manifests when unhealthy stress externally, when we're very internal is irritability. And it's the type of irritability, I mean, we all get irritable, right? So that's not the point. The point is it's the type of irritability um, that either goes from like zero to 60 very quickly. And you think, oh my gosh, I'm overreacting. Or someone makes a comment that you're overreacting. Or it's the irritability that you find things that, that you weren't irritable about. Now you are. 
uh, you're finding that maybe you're not as patient and you're not as tolerant of certain people or certain situations and then you get irritated more quickly and and then it feels like a little surge it almost feels like some anger underneath that it's a very gnawing and annoying irritability and that's what manifests externally when we're going through these states here so that was a review. And then oftentimes too, another way it manifests greatly unhealthy stress, because sometimes this overwhelming, this churning and ruminating and internal isolation, isolation does not stop when you want to go to bed. So there's two types of insomnia that are stress related. And one of them is, yes, you have a difficulty going to sleep and you find yourself lying there for an hour or more and not realizing how much time has passed because you're churning in your head and you're going inward and it's going round and round and round. And if you could only solve this problem before you go to sleep, things would be better, right? The unfortunate thing is it just keeps you up. And then you may finally go to, you obviously will go to sleep at some point. Um, or it manifests early in the morning, anywhere from like 3.30 or 4 in the morning until about 5 or so, because that's the time when your body actually is feeling a little restored and your adrenal glands and your hormones are starting to wake yourself up. And in that hour and a half, if you've got a very active brain or your REM sleep is rising and your adrenals are also waking up your body, those two come together and bam, you wake up and you start spinning right away. It's almost like you didn't even take a breath, right? Or you, and your thinking never stopped. You're thinking about the same thing you thought about when you, before you went to sleep. And that is the other type of insomnia it can cause because of that phenomenon in the morning when your body's rested, trying to get you up, and then your brain goes bing and starts doing the ruminating and the global thinking and, and the churning. So today's focus is, is then what are the remedies? Um, and the remedy is an emotional well-being and mental health practice. And why I use the word practice because it is cr critical, I believe, to understand and to implement a practice, a daily practice of ways that keep your emotional well-being and your mental health at least stable or that you pull yourself out of some of these grudges or dreads or feelings. And the best way to do that is to have a regular practice, right? Rather than waiting until it gets very extreme and then trying to figure out what to do. So here are some of the remedy things to keep in mind in regarding an emotional well-being and mental health practice. One of them is, is that it's important to know the difference between self-care and self-medication, all right? And what I mean by that is that self-care is a healthy pattern to do things that break emotional and mental patterns of stress, uh, like I was just describing, that help elevate your mood, that, that are restorative, that keep you functioning, that they create time and space that's restorative and you feel a little refreshed or at least you've had distance from this, from the problem or the stressors that you had and you can go back and enter into that stressful space, feeling a little refreshed, a little more focused, a little restored. That's how you know you're doing self-care and it's helpful. Self-medication tends to be when you reward yourself for all the stress that you're going through. And that it's and it's unhealthy in the way and it be, or it becomes unhealthy. So, for example, while I'm you know having a glass of wine with dinner or a couple of glasses in the evening is not an issue, but when it can become an issue or things like it, like having chocolate or eating you know overeating a bit or whatever it is or spending more time playing games on your screen, is when you're using it. And you have thoughts such as, oh, my day was so stressful. I deserve this. My day was so stressful. I'm going to have that extra glass of wine, right? All of us have done that, or I would say most people have. And, and I understand it. But the issue is, is that what that can happen is, is that then you start associating with that your self-care when it's actually not. Because there's nothing restorative about a glass of wine or playing games on your screen or overeating or eating a lot of sweets. Uh, as a matter of fact, over a long-term basis, if they become habitual tendencies, they can have negative effects. So this is something to be aware of. 
right? Is what you're thinking is around when you have that glass of wine and really look, are you trying to reward yourself for all the stress you went through? Or are you trying to manage it in a way that alleviates your stress or helps dial it down so that you feel restored and refreshed? And one check question in once in a while is that have I engaged in any patterns that might be a little self-destructive, unhealthy, or addictive? Are there some habitual tendencies happening here? Am I wanting to reward myself because I deserve it because of all the things I've been through? That's just a little red flag that you it's important and valuable you might find to be aware of. So tips on self-care. One of the things to just understand and an important and valuable question to ask yourself is what was modeled in your family? For example, was self-care thought of as selfish? Was it thought of being lazy? Or was it thought of, of something that was necessary to help you get through your day, to help you complete a task that breaks were valued and breaks were modeled? You know, was it the type, were you the type of family Endless research has always shown that, like, for example, when a person takes a long exam or needs to study for a big exam, that those that take the like a four hour exam, for example, that take that 10 minute break when they're allotted every hour, hour and a half do better on the test. They just do. And they finish on time or people who study and make sure that they take a break every 90 minutes or so retain and do better in studying. There is great value, and it's been shown academically that it's great value in taking breaks. And so what did your family mo model? Did you have to push it through and, and you know there was no time for breaks? Or was there? Because that really will influence the internal dialogue you have yourself about self-care. And if you find yourself having difficulty with a bunch of starts or stops, or actually making time for self-care, then chances are there might be some, some thoughts and thinking around it that are obstacles, and that's good to be aware of. So you might even want to journal about that a little bit. The other thing about self-care is take it in small steps. Um, so often, and especially this is the beginning of the new year, that will you know, set a path, okay, you know, I'm gonna go to bed every night at 10.30, and I'm gonna make sure I get up at five, and I'm gonna run my three miles, and I'm gonna do this five, week, five days a week and you haven't done it regularly like that for the last four months or maybe even ever, you want to break it down into small steps. It's really okay to start small. It's really okay to go, okay, you know what? My lunch break is an hour and I haven't gotten out and taken a walk in months. I'm going to make sure that I get up and go out for at least 15 minutes every day to take a walk. That's a step, setting a pedometer and starting out slow and then getting building your steps up. You know, um, those are all valuable and they're long lasting. They're more long lasting when you start doing self-care in small steps and build on it than when you just try and do a complete plan. And that helps the process be continual rather than off and on. And that's what you're looking for is a continual process. If you remember, I'm calling this a practice, which means you're working up to it being a daily practice, something, a habit. It's, it'll become habitual. It's just something you do during your day. It's just something that you discover that, oh, you know, I can't even remember, but I take a 15 to 20 minute walk every day during my lunch when I'm at work. I've just done it and it just happens. And it's just part of the schedule or, you know, every morning I make sure that I, I walk, even I walk to Starbucks and then I walk around the block or I do some meditation or make sure I do a little yoga three times a week. And I do that three mornings. I've done that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every morning, those kinds of things. That's the internal dialogue that will help you sustain a healthy practice of self-care. And remember, you can always reset. So if a couple of weeks go by because things were just so overwhelming or you had a special project at work or you had to work extra shifts and you fell off your, you know, you weren't doing your mental health practice, you can always reset. You can start small again or you can pick up where you left off. It's really okay. Try to be aware of a kind of an all or nothing thinking, which is, ugh. There I go again. I missed it for two weeks. Why even bother? Why should I start again? That kind of thinking is just going to potentially lead you more into back to self-medication and you're rewarding yourself or 
it will halt or be an obstacle to your self-care. And be more present. Check in during the day. So self-care can be flexible. You know, if, you, if you're unable to do something every single day that you'd like to, <clears throat> then ask yourself questions during the day, such as, do I feel rested today? Um, I noticed I'm really irritable today. Are there some more things in my, you know, are, is there some things that are very overwhelming right now? And if so, then what you want to do is address that. You address, okay, so how can I get more rest today? Tonight, rather than watching my hour of TV, which I really love, I'm going to go to bed a little bit early because last couple of nights I haven't been sleeping well and I want to reset. Or, um, you know, I, I really want to make sure that I get up and do a little exercise tomorrow morning. So also, I haven't done that in a while. I'm going to go to bed earlier. These things will help you. And it's based off of questions you ask yourself day to day. And if you find yourself irritable, rather than going to a place of, oh my gosh, and you know what I just said to, to my coworker, I can't believe I did that. And oh, they must feel awful. And I'm such an awful person. That steps into ruminating and all that thinking. It's more like, okay, I'm feeling pretty irritable. I'm going to go back and apologize and just acknowledge that I've been a little stressed out lately. And then I need to take a look at my mental health practice and my well-being and see uh, how I'm doing here because I need to figure out ways to get restored. That would be the healthy narrative, the narrative you want to move towards to help you maintain uh, I know emotional well-being and mental health practice that will be full of self-care and help you uh, manage your unhealthy stress, which these days is pretty unavoidable as far as the stress levels. And you want to be conscious about moving yourself towards connection, externalizing, or an experience of joy, or these days at least contentment. You're looking for those moments where you feel a little content, like, oh, okay, really rough day today, and I managed it well. I didn't really, I didn't get really irritable because, you know, I, I did that journaling this morning and that seemed to really help. Um, or, wow, you know, I felt really connected to my coworkers today. Um, or, you know, I reached out and I had a couple of Zoom meetings with friends in the last week. Those are all examples of how you know that your self-care is working and that you are managing your unhealthy stress and you want to work towards that connection and reaching out and feelings of joy or contentment. And those are signs that'll tell you that you're doing well. So now I'm going to take each one separately and give you some tips on how to manage it. So overwhelm, one of the words you're going to see throughout the next four or five slides is acceptance. And what I mean by acceptance, and this is always a tricky one when I work with people, they're like, but Elizabeth, I can't accept because if I accept, then I stay in a state of overwhelm. And that's not quite what I'm talking about. I can understand that concern. But what I'm talking about is accepting. Whew, okay, the last 11 months have been really overwhelming because there's just been so much stuff happening. And being able to accept the fact that there's been overwhelming circumstances. Because when you accept that, then you can move into action. It's not about accepting the fact you're overwhelmed and then not doing anything about it. It's accepting the fact that, yeah, my mind has been racing. And yeah, there's been a lot of stuff going on. And so I do need to take more care of myself. That's where the acceptance is going to lead you, right? And so how do you do that? Well, when you're overwhelmed, there's, there's a few things to do. Just when you're finding yourself overwhelmed is the classic, it's breathing. Breathing is the one thing that you have with you from the moment you are born until the moment that you pass away. It is the one tool we always have with us. And you can breathe in different ways that will help you at least dial down the internal overwhelm or the internal experience of elevated anxiety or dread, right? And many of you probably know and maybe even have breathing practices. So this is just a reminder to use them. Then what I mean by belly breaths is one way to do it is to make sure that you're drawing your breath down all the way into your lungs in a way that you can actually feel your stomach rise and fall. 
When your stomach rises and falls, that means that the air is going down to the bottom one third of your lungs. Because oftentimes when we're in an elevated state of anxiety or a consistent mood of anxiety and overwhelm, what happens is our breath starts getting more shallow. And we literally do not breathe down into the bottom one third. When our lungs aren't getting fully filled up with air, it's sending a red alert to our body that something's not quite right, which then helps influence the state of overwhelm. So you want to do the opposite. So just taking some deep breath and even putting your hand on your stomach and just making sure that your stomach rises and falls when you breathe. That's a good sign that you're taking deep breaths. The other kind of breath that can be very useful is a, a three, four breath, which is where you inhale to the count of three and then you exhale to the count of four. And it's a lovely little breath strategy. It does work and it can help. And you can do it on the go. Nobody needs to know what you're doing. Or you could inhale to the count of four and exhale to the count of five. The point is, is that you want your exhale to be at least one or two counts longer than your inhale. Because that helps the body recalibrate and bring it back down to a state where overwhelm can be more manageable. Pacing. Similarly, is that you just want to pace yourself, right? When, when anxiety and overwhelm happen, we often get revved up and start thinking faster and moving faster and wanting, making sure that things get done and more of that rapid fire. And while that's necessary at times, it also can fuel overwhelm. And that in many ways is how anxious people make people anxious. Stressed out people can make people stressed out because there's this certain energy and I'm thinking that many of you that are listening to this probably know it, are aware of it, have done it yourself. Um, that, and you want, in order to shift that energy and that attitude, is pace yourself. Hit this pause button for a moment, take a breath, and then move forward. There's a great mindfulness method, which is called stop, which literally is stop, take a breath, observe. So observe what's going on internally and externally, and then proceed. You do that a few times through the day that will help keep that overwhelm and that churning mind, at least dial it down if not stop it for a few moments. And just even a few minutes can be very helpful. And restorative time. Making sure as I was talking earlier that you have an emotional well-being and mental health practice in a way that restores you, that it truly is self-care that you have a hobby that you still are engaging in, or you have books that you're reading for fun, right? You're doing other things that really generate an experience of suspension of time in a way that is fulfilling and restorative, right? It's a healthy disconnect. It like suspends you from all that's going on. You can kind of move it out. I'm sure you've had this experience. Runners have it. Physical exercise is a great way to do it. And you're so focused on what you're doing that it's kind of suspends time and it is fulfilling and satisfying and gratifying. That's what restorative time is. And so making sure you have a little bit of that in your day or your week is very important and helps with the overwhelm. Rumination. So here's some things to do about ruminating. First off, you want to collect data. I'm also very big on this. When people come to me and say, you know, I've got this, I, I'm thinking that I worry a lot. Well, we start with, okay, how much do you worry? When do you worry? Are there certain things that trigger your worry? Same thing with rumination. So just don't take it for granted that, oh yeah, I must be ruminating. I invite you for the next few days or the next week to an hour a day or for one day, whatever works for you, just be consciously aware of what you're thinking is and that you're just going to observe it and you start noticing that, oh yeah, I ruminate at least like 10 times an hour or wow, I seem to, after I just get done talking to my boss that I spin in my head for a while before I'm able to refocus at work. That is collecting the data. You wanna understand first that can be very helpful of what kind of ruminator you are, when you do it, how long, what does it impact you? This can be helpful so you know uh, more consciously how to implement some of the tools I'm going to tell you in this moment. Once again, there's that word acceptance, the same thing of like, okay, 
I'm going to go into this meeting with my boss and I know that afterwards I typically ruminate. So I don't have any meetings after that. I'm going to make sure I take my 15 minute walk and do my belly breaths and make sure I can move this forward a bit. That's an example. You've accepted that you know this is going to happen. And so you're going to do something about it. One of the really kind of good, well, this one worry time can work really well uh, for many people. Doesn't work for everyone, but worry time's kind of fun. R worry time is if you're the type of ruminator uh, that you ruminate a lot or that you feel that there is value to ruminating or you just like it because it feels good. For some people, it's it, you've spun for so long that you could actually, you know, it's kind of depriving to think about not thinking this way. So what you do is you set up time to worry. I have people, basically when I do this is you set a time in your phone, the alarm goes off 10 a.m. Monday every day uh, at 10 a.m. and you sit and you worry for a half an hour. Do, you don't do, it, do not do it for any longer than a half an hour and you can do it up to twice a day if you want, if you're a really heavy, intense ruminator, which is fine. And what you're doing is, is you're sitting there and you're worrying or you're working and you're worrying. You're allowing yourself to go into that habitual tendency, that feel good groove for about a half an hour. And you're making notes when that half an hour is up, you jot down somehow the notes in your phone, on a Word doc, on a piece of paper, whatever. You're worrying what you worried about. So that when worry time comes up again, it's kind of like putting things in the thing, putting your list into the things to do box. It's like, okay, I worried about this right now. I'm not done. And so I'm going to put it in the box and tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. I'm going to deal with it again. Compartmentalizing. Anything you do with your mind to compartmentalize can really help with rumination because rumination doesn't compartmentalize. It doesn't know how. It likes to smush all kinds of things together and mix them up. And so compartmentalizing your worry can be very useful. And then the next day, you pull out your list. And guess what? Often what happens is, is you look at your list and go, why am I worrying about that? I don't need to think about that anymore. And so you can check it off your list. And then you just make another list. The other thing also, another good exercise that helps with linear thinking, because that's what you want to move to. You want to move to the ability to analyze and examine things rather than to go global or uh, catastrophic or magnifying and those other thought processes I talked about earlier. The ABCs. ABCs is a really nice strategy that can be used a couple of ways. One, it's good. What it does is, is that when you find yourself ruminating, you think of, for example, fruits. And you start making a list from A, B, C, D. So fruits, apples, B, berries, C, cherries, right? And you keep going through the list. And pretty much you never quite finish the list. What happens is your mind just moves on to other things. And that's okay, because that's what you want, right? You're trying to divert yourself from that ruminating experience. The other way to do ABCs is a gratefulness list. A gratefulness list is a really useful thing. Any of you that are struggling with dread or depression and having difficulty getting up, um, I recommend you commit to doing a gratefulness list for 30 days. This is not a new strategy. It's a, just a very powerful and effective strategy. And every day you write down three to five things that you're grateful for, either when you wake up or before you go to bed. And you review that list. And if you do that for 30 days, I pretty much, I, I hesitate to say I guarantee, I don't like to guarantee, but I'm 99% certain that you're going to notice the shift in your mood and you won't have that intense depressive mood. The other way to do a gratefulness list is through the ABCs and just start thinking of all things you're grateful for based off the letter. So what am I grateful for that begins with an A, a B, a C, a D? And that's also very helpful. Because once again, it moves you into linear thinking, into analyzing something, and it generates an action. And that's what you're looking for, to move you out of rumination. So how to address thinking styles such as I've been talking about, global magnification, all or nothing. Once again, collect the data, 
take a day and see what are your go-tos. We all have our go-tos of twisted, what I'd call twisted thinking styles. I tend to be an all or nothing thinking when I get stressed out. Everything becomes always never, um, you know, why does this always happen to me kind of thing. And when that thought starts popping up in my head, I know now I'm like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm really stressed out here, right? Rather than believing the thought and thinking, yeah, why does this always happen to me? This happened to me, that happened to me, right? That would be buying into it and going off in rumination. And so collecting data and getting an understanding, do you have a tendency to magnify things? Do you have a tendency to do extremes? Always, never. Do you have a tendency to do a lot of what if it, what ifs? Um, and just seeing where you go. And then once again, there's that word acceptance, accepting when it arises, right? Because you accept it and then you figure out, okay, so what am I going to do with it? Well, what you're going to do with it is a couple of things. What you can do, so for example, if you're a big what ifer, uh, or you kind of go global, one is to, to get specific, break things down in small bites and say, okay, what's actually happening in front of me, right? Or examine the evidence. And what examine the evidence is, is that you ask yourself, you say, oh, you know, um, what evidence do I have here that that I'm going to go, you know, go hungry here in the next two days? Um, or what evidence do I have here that everything is going to fall apart? And you look because you want to separate your feelings from the facts. Your facts are not feelings and your feelings aren't facts. And they both exist in a moment, especially in a stressful moment. And sometimes they get all mushed together. So you want to do something that will separate them. I'm feeling really worried because I'm thinking that uh, I might be sick and I'm not going to be able to go to work tomorrow. Okay, so what evidence do I have that I'm sick? Do I have a temperature? No. Do I have a sore throat? No. Do I have a slight headache? Yes. Have I drank water at all today? No. Is it possibly that? Oh, maybe. Maybe I should just drink water this afternoon and see what happens. See, it leads you to a solution. And that's what you're looking for rather than staying stuck in the emotion and the worry of it. And then the other one here is I invite you, this is why data is important, that if you happen to be more of an all or nothing thinker, something to think about is then, well, where can I go with this? Um, you know, is shifting your language. So if you're aware that you do a lot of always, nevers, um, then in more extremes, what I call the zero to 10, then what you're looking for is the shades of gray, which is what I call the one through nine. And what the one through nine is, is language such as maybe, possibly, often, sometimes, frequently, almost always, almost never. Those, that's the language and the space that is very beneficial to live in, especially when you're stressed, because stress is gonna take you and polarize, right? And you want to stay in the place that's more accurate and true and helpful, which is language that is more accurate, such as frequently, sometimes, always, maybe, perhaps. So I invite you to even practice that like for an hour. If you notice you're stressed out and you tend to, to go all or nothing, then challenge yourself to say for like the next even 30 minutes, I'm going to make sure that I use language such as always frequently and stay more in that one through nine because that's really where life is most of the time. So internal isolation and irritability. What I invite you with this, if these arise, use them as a barometer. Because if you've reached this point where you've noticed you're internally isolating and you're going through that disconnect that I spoke of early, or you're finding the degrees of irritability that I spoke about early, the zero to 60 or being more irritable about things that you're normally not, then use it and go, oh, okay, that's a sign. I'm overwhelmed. I'm stressed out to an unhealthy level. And use that so then you can begin to implement your tools or your emotional well-being and mental health practice, whatever that is. And the more you practice it, the easier it is to access. So when you like, oh, I noticed I totally was standing there talking to that person and I spaced out and have no idea what we just talked about. Might be a sign of internal isolation. So what are you going to use? Then you use that as, oh, okay, I'm going to use my tools. And 
when this is happening, if you're aware of it, you want to engage in self-restorative moments. So this might be where you're going to take an extra break today. You're going to make sure that you reach out and talk to people, either about your internal experience or just connect with people. Once again, going external, right? That is one big thing. Making connection is helpful, right? And as I said, you're talking about it, talk about your experience, talk about what's going on for you, or just listen to someone else talking. Um, just ask them about their day, what they're doing, that can all help. And it's okay to reset. And what I mean about in this one is, is that if you find yourself going really inward, and you didn't pay attention to something, it's really okay to say, you know what, I'm sorry, I was distracted in my head. Can you repeat that? Or if you're irritable, it's all right to apologize. It's all right to say, well, you know, I'm just having a really tough time today. And I just recognize that I just really snapped at you. And I just want to apologize for that. It's okay to do that. Even in the workplace, it's all right to do that. You just reset. So insomnia, which is one of the manifestations that happens and probably uh, many of you are struggling it with, with because people last week asked me, they wanted me to speak more speci specifically to this this week. So here's a couple of ways to deal with, with uh, insomnia. If you have difficulty going to sleep, then you wanna make sure to check on your sleep rituals. Are you transitioning into a time of sleep? Or are you just falling asleep in front of the computer and then waking up at midnight and then dropping into bed? Okay. Or something like that. Do you have a, like a half an hour that you change your clothes, put on your pajamas, you drink a glass of water, brush your teeth, wash your face, read a little on a book, try and stay away from screens, especially right now. I think Kindle's reading books is probably okay, but we're on screen so much and there is enough research to show that it really does impact our brains in a way that can be uh, contributing to insomnia that I invite you to try and have a little time off, try and detox from it a little bit. Um, telling yourself, okay, I'm, you know, I'm getting ready to go to bed. It's sleep time. Using that time to slow down and turn towards sleep. Not using that time to spin another problem or to ruminate a little longer before you go to sleep, right? So actively moving your thoughts and your mind's thinking to, this is sleep time. I'm going to be going to sleep. I'm looking forward to reading this book for a few minutes and then I'm going to sleep. Another way to do that is, is then as you're starting to go to sleep, focus on what's comfortable. So focus on my pillow is really comfortable. I really like these pajamas I'm wearing, or I love the t-shirt that I have on. It's so soft and well-worn. Focusing on what is comfortable. What you focus on is what you amplify. When you go want to go to sleep, what you're trying to amplify is feeling tired and feeling comfortable. That is what will put you to sleep. So try and have your thoughts turning in that direction. Now, if you wake up in the middle of the night and start churning, the ABCs is a great method, which I explained earlier, is just, okay, I'm gonna go through the list of fruits. And more often than not, I use this one myself and you won't finish the alphabet and you do go back to sleep. Other ways is such as just counting backwards by threes. You know, actively engaging your brain in something that absorbs it enough that it keeps you focused on it, but it's methodical enough that at some point you're gonna get bored and you're gonna to go to sleep. Deep breathing can help, just drawing that breath in your stomach uh, and focusing on the inhale and the exhale, um, doing different breathing techniques, doing a body scan. Uh, for those of you that know some mindfulness strategies, which is, you know, now I feel my toes and I'm going to squeeze my toes and then I'm going to relax my toes. And now I feel my ankle and, and starting to go through your body. That can help you go to sleep. And then there are apps such as Cal the Calm app seems to be one of the better ones out there. But any apps that have little meditations or things that you can do to help you go to sleep and or, uh, you know, in the middle of the night, have it ready if it's something that works. So all you got to do is just put it on and you can drift back off to sleep. 
The other thing I don't have here that really works um, that I've done for years and, and many and some people who struggle with insomnia have, which is if you have the ability, go sleep somewhere else. Like when I wake up in the middle of the night, I immediately just go into the study and sleep on the couch. It's a comfortable place. It's set up and I fall back to sleep right away. Some people literally have two different beds in their room if they are insomniac and if they know this works and when they wake up, they just go into the other bed. Now, I know that's not possible for everyone, but I did want to put that out there that just changing your place where you sleep can be very helpful and then just cause you to go right back to sleep. Okay. For some people, it wakes them up more. So if that's you, then you want to stick more to these. It just depends. That's then important in collecting data and understanding what works for you or doesn't. All right, so I hope that you found this helpful. This is who I am, Elizabeth Dondonell, uh, the East Bay Center for Anxiety Relief in Alameda, California, the phone number and email address and our website if you'd like to take a look. And thank you for listening. And I will be presenting next week to the Chamber on communication, how to communicate when you're stressed out, how to communicate with yourself, how to communicate with your colleagues and um, your staff, uh, also, how to communicate if you're having difficulty with customers. There's a few tips and tricks that could apply to all those scenarios. So I look forward to uh, talking to all of you next week. Thanks. Bye.